According to Wikipedia, a lien is a form of security interest granted over an item of property to secure the payment of a debt or performance of some other obligation. The owner of the property who grants the lien is referred to as the lienee, and the person who has the benefit of the lien is referred to as the lienor or lien holder. The etymological root is Anglo-French lien or loyen, meaning bond, restraint, from the Latin ligamen, from ligare, to bind. According to Wordnick, the American Heritage Dictionary of the English Language, 5th edition, lien, a claim upon a part of another person's property that arises because of an unpaid debt related to that property and that operates as an encumbrance on the property, in, property until the debt is satisfied. The right to hold another person's property is a security for a debt allowed, number two. Three, a legal claim, a charge upon real or personal property for the satisfaction of some debt or duty, a right in one to control or hold and retain the property of another until some claim of the former is paid or satisfied. Now you understand the full context of the word alien or alien, owing one, owing political allegiance to another country or government, foreign, Two, belonging to characteristic of or consultate, constituting another and very different place, society, or person, strange synonym, foreign. Three, dissimilar, inconsistent, or opposed, as in nature. Emotions alien to her temperament. This is from the American Heritage Dictionary of the English Language, 5th edition, Mort Wordnick, and we should know that alien, in fact, means alien. In the, this book, we can find a explanation of the older form that these concepts were put into practice, older being from 1660 to 1775, Trade and Empire, the British Customs Service in Colonial America by Thomas C. Barrow, Harvard University Press, Cambridge, Massachusetts, 1967. Copyright 1967 by the President and Fellows of Harvard College, All Rights Reserved, distributed in Great Britain by Oxford University Press, London, Library of Congress catalog number 67-11666. That's interesting. Three sixes, right? <laughs> Printed in the United States of America to my mother and father. On page seven, <clears throat> the, I guess in this case, third paragraph is important here. We won't go into the paragraph above it. The question remains of why, if regulation was the motive, duties were imposed in the colonies. Enforcement of the provisions concerning enumerated commodities in the earlier acts depended principally on the use of bonds. A ship before going to the colonies was required to give bond, guaranteeing that if enumerated commodities were taken on board in the course of the voyage, they would be brought to England or English territory and not elsewhere. If evidence appeared showing that this requirement had been violated, the bonds could be put in suit in a court of law. It seems odd that the English government did not think it enough merely to extend enforcement of the bonding provisions to the colonies. A great deal of confusion might have been avoided had they done so. In January 1676, merely three years after the passage of the Act, the Privy Council's Committee on Plantation Affairs, the Lords of Trade, were themselves bewildered about the purpose of the duties collected in the colonies. Here on page 54 to 55, we get further in-depth explanation of exactly how this scheme works. Perhaps the most important feature in the new act was the extension of the act of frauds to the colonies. This act, passed in 1662, had protected the customs officers in England against personal harm and had given them extensive powers of enforcement. Under that act, the officers were entitled to general search warrants, known as writs of assistance, and permitted the right of forceful entry in cases of suspected concealment of illegally imported goods. Now, these privileges were granted to the colonial officers in their powers, rights, and obligations. They were made the complete equals of the officers in England. The next article provided that proceeds from Caesars should be distributed as formally one-third to the king, one-third to the governor, and one-third to the person who should put the suit in prosecution, which is basically all the collectors. They all really only had the abilities to do that. <laughs> To facilitate successful prosecutions, the burden of proof was placed on the defendants in all cases arising from illegal importation or exportation of goods from the colonies. To clear up any doubts as to the meaning of the Act of 1673, it was explicitly stated that payment of the enumerated duties did not excuse a captain from posting bond to carry the enumerated goods only to England or another English territory. 
now in 55, the ninth paragraph of the new law contained implicit recognition of the failure of the Stuart policy of internal control of the colonies, realistically providing for the existence of an organized opposition to the imperial system in the plantations. It was stated that all laws, bylaws, usages, or customs at this time or which hereafter shall be in practice or endeavored or pretend to be in force or practice in any of the said plantations which are in any wise repugnant to the before mentioned laws. Notice that word, repugnant or to this present act are illegal, null and void, to all interests and purposes whatsoever. The Stuarts had hoped to control the laws at the source in the colonial legislatures. King William's Parliament accepted the abandonment, or at least the postponement, of that ideal solution. Where they could not control the creation of law, they could invalidate objectionable enactments after passage. For the next 60 years, review of colonial legislation was a major administrative assignment in England. Remembering that word repugnant, we will go and look at the United States stamp duties containing all the acts of Congress and decisions of Commissioner of Internal Revenue relating thereto, carefully compared and corrected by official copies of the same. San Francisco, published by Kenny and Alexander Booksellers and Stationers, number 608, Montgomery Street, 1863. Now, before we get to the section that uses that specific word repugnant, we need to look at section 5. And be it further enacted that all contracts, loads, or sales of gold and silver, coin and bullion, not made in accordance with this act, shall be wholly and absolutely void. And in addition to the penalties provided in the act to which this is an amendment, any party to said contract may at any time within one year from the date of the contract bring suit before any court of competent jurisdiction to recover back for his own use and benefit the money paid on any contract not made in accordance with this act. So the important thing to note here is that they are not in fact voiding the quote-unquote debt. They are voiding the payment of such debt, which includes all payments of debt made in gold or silver, which the Constitution stipulates is the only method to pay for debt. Well, all of those payments that were made have been essentially voided by this document here, which is the exact same thing that we just saw in that book previous. Furthermore, on page 37, no conveyance, deed, mortgage, or writing whereby any lands, tenements, realty, or other property shall be sold, granted, assigned, or otherwise conveyed, or shall be made as security for the payment of any sum of money, shall be required to pay a stamp duty of more than the sum of $1,000, anything to the contrary notwithstanding. Like the Constitution, of course. Finally, in this document on page 40, section 37, it states, And be it further enacted that this act, except where otherwise indicated, shall take effect from time and after its passage, and all acts and parts of acts repugnant, right, there's your word there, repugnant, to the provisions of this act, be and the same are hereby repealed. That includes the U.S. Constitution. So, who exactly are these people that put a lien against our lives and use us as essentially surety for the payment of debts that were put back into force by that fraudulent document from the period before the War for Independence? Well, for this context, I uh, will use an example, and we can look and well, start with an example from Hocking Hills, Ohio. This is... Called, this company is called Bow Outdoors, or Bay, I don't know however what they want to say that. Uh, the Hawking Hills Bud Fit, Bigfoot Festival, Concession, and Vendor Rules and Regulations. Notice in the bottom part, it states, Lisey agrees to, in consideration of the space leased to Lisey by Bay Outdoors Hawking Hills Bigfoot Festival, Lisey does hereby contract and agree with Bay Outdoors Hawking Hills Bigfoot Festival that Lisey will, at the sole expense of the Lisey, hold Bay Outdoors Hawking Hills Bigfoot Festival together with each and every and all of its officers, volunteers, and employees, harmless and blameless from any and all claims, suits, or other legal actions for damages arising out of the lease of the premises as set forth herein. Further, Lisey promises and agrees to provide a defense at the expense of the leasee to said Bay Outdoors Hawking Hills Bigfoot Festival and for any litigation entering uh, entered against Bay Outdoors Hawking Hills Bigfoot Festival. So that's obviously 
really wicked what they're doing there. But yeah, basically they're stating that if, uh, <laughs> it's quite ridiculous. You agree to pay for their defense in case of them doing something to you. And also you agree that they can basically do whatever they want and, um, you can't do anything about it. All right. That's what that little sneaky passage there is about. Also, we should notice uh, two sections on this page where it states, Lisi herewith submits a certificate of insurance, or we could say surety, or say a bond, or the equivalent thereof, indicating that Lisi is covered by a policy of liability insurance at least in the amount of $1 million per incident. Lisi understands that this contract shall be enforced until said certificate of insurance has been deposited with Bay Outdoors Hocking Hills Bigfoot Festival. All right, so you indemnify them, according to that passage before that we read, from all culpability, and you also pay for their defense. So when you pay for their defense, they'll make a claim, $1 million, against the insurance policy that they will say that you violated, basically. And, yeah, so that's... Um, possibly one angle to this, but there are many. Really, the purpose behind this, though, isn't any of this stuff. It's actually to push people out in the local area so that they can bring in all of their little subsidiary corporations and all their fake entities that all have ill-gotten gains and stolen property come in and do business all for the same individuals under the guise of, quote-unquote, local ownership. <clears throat> also, by signing a contract with Bay Outdoors, or Bea, Hawking Hills Bigfoot Festival, the leasee agrees to follow all rules and regulations of Baya Outdoors Hawking Hills Bigfoot Festival. If the leasee violates any of the rules or regulations set forth by Baya Outdoors Hawking Hills Bigfoot Festival, the contract between these two parties will become null and void. Don't you love this repetition of the same words that they use throughout all history, almost? They're running a scam. They are illegitimate. They are doing things from a playbook. And that's the reason why they use the same tactics, the same wording, and they are essentially the same people, considering the fact that most of these people are simply carrying out mandates given to them by somebody else, and they don't really have any choice in the matter. I mean, they do. They could choose not to do it, of course, which honestly they should, considering the consequences of these activities. But it is important to notice the pattern and repetition here that spans hundreds of years, possibly even thousands. Now, the next part that we should notice in this, other than the fact, of course, that they repeat all the same crap over and over again, is they state that any property that will have five or more campers, RVs, or portable camping units parked in the lot for the show will be required to submit plans and apply for a temporary camp license from the Hawking County Health Department. A representative from the Hawking County Health Department dist or Health District will conduct an inspection of the camps during the festival. The purpose of the licensing and inspecting of the campsites are to prevent overcrowding and fire hazards, sewage, blah, blah, blah. That is their declared purpose. That is not their true purpose, of course. The Hawking County Health Department is also behind the implementation of a quote-unquote full-time code enforcement officer position who run around enforcing international property maintenance codes. I've done a video about that previously, so I'm not going to cover that again. Now, if we go to the business filings for Bear Outdoors, it's listed a Beatrice Elizabeth Mills at a P.O. Box address. And you should notice, obviously, they use a lot of P.O. Box addresses and they have a lot of tactics to try to hide because the individuals responsible don't want to be essentially culpable personally for the crimes they're committing. According to the general nature of business conducted by the registrant, it's retail, education, outdoor nature, photography. So if we Google Beatrice Mills, Londonbury, Ohio, I do believe that was the name of the place, but um, anyway, we will notice that there is a Beatrice E. Mills with an address at in Columbus, Ohio, and Lancaster, Ohio, but also at the, in the this hit, <clears throat> marked in purple, there's a Beatrice Mills salesperson, realtor, and that they that person has from London Bear, London Dairy, Ohio, Ross County, as a real estate agent. If we click on that link, 
uh, real estate dash is real dash estate dash agent dash lists.com forward slash real estate forward slash profile forward slash Beatrice Mills forward slash that number there states the page you requested was removed. Moving on, we're going to go ahead and look at the Hawking County single audit for the year ended December 31st, 2021 by certified public accountant Milhuff Stang, CPA Incorporated. Here we'll look at a section titled Buckeye Joint County Self-Insurance Council. The Buckeye Joint County Self-Insurance Council is a jointly governed organization that serves Athens, Hawking, Jackson, Meigs, Monroe, Morgan, Noble, Perry, Pike, Vinton, and Washington counties and was formed as an insurance purchasing pool for the purpose of providing general liability, law enforcement, professional, and fleet insurance. The member counties provide operating resources to the organization based on actuarially determined rates. The degree of control exercised by any participating government is limited to its representation on the board. Hawking County does not have any ongoing interest or responsibility in the organization. That does not mean what you would think it means, but they always play these little word games anyway. The Ohio Government Risk Management Plan. The Buckeye Joint County Self-Insurance Council belongs to Notice that word belongs, as in property of. The Ohio Government Risk Management Plan, an unincorporated nonprofit association with approximately 500 public entity members providing a formalized, jointly administered self-insurance risk management program and other administrative services. Pursuant to section blah, blah, blah of the Ohio Revised Code, which is, of course, foreign codes and is unlawful and illegitimate, blah, blah, blah. The plan is deemed to a separate legal entity, just like the... um, Vatican Bank is a separate, quote-unquote, legal entity from the Pope. A creature of the Pope, as was worded by our illustrious Carmignani lawyer from Rome, <clears throat> from documents I've covered, uh, or a document specifically I've covered in other videos. Anyway, the plan provides property, liability, errors, and omissions, law enforcement, automobile, excess liability, crime, surety, and bond, inland marine, and other coverages modified for each member's needs. The plan pays judgments, settlements, and other expenses resulting from covered claims that exceed the member's deductible. Also in this document, under note 13, long-term debt continued, the county has pledged future sewer customer revenues, net of specified operating expenses, to repay $207,600 and $111,400 Original issue amounts of three hundred and thirty three thousand and two hundred and twenty seven thousand in sewer revenue bonds issued in nineteen ninety six and nineteen ninety one respectively. Proceeds from the bonds provided financing for the construction of the Rock Bridge and Haydenville wastewater treatment facilities. The bonds are payable solely from sewer customer net revenues and are payable through twenty thirty seven. Annual principal and interest payments on the bonds are generally expected to require approximately 46% of net revenues. The total principal and interest remaining to be paid on the bonds is 445992 principal and interest paid for the current year and total customer net revenues were 33435 and 165432 respectively. So basically, they take out a loan using the surety of future revenues paid by the people who are forced, otherwise they'll be, um, <clears throat> they, they will be listed as vagrants or homeless because they don't have connected sewer lines. Well, when you're forced to do that, they take all of those predicted revenues and use it as surety to take out a loan. If that, well, we have a word for that. <laughs> Now, here's an interesting note. <clears throat> Current financial related activities. Hawking County is strong financially at the present time. However, as the pre- preceding information shows, the county heavily depends on its property taxpayers as well as intergovernmental monies. So basically, extortion with these things called taxes, which are not lawful taxes, they're illegitimate, um, used for paying the lien that's been placed on all of our lives because the U.S. Constitution and all debts that were paid under that were then made null and void, and thus everything else is put back in force, and so there we are going to endlessly be paying on debts that were created a long, long time ago because we have a lien on our lives, right? That's what that's about. But also the land itself. Anyway, since the property tax revenues do not grow at the same level as inflation, and because states 
state and federal mandates continue without providing the additional revenues resources needed to continue such programs. The county will be faced with significant challenges over the next several years to contain costs and ultimately consider the possibility of having to go back to the voters for an additional real estate tax levy. What does that sound like? Well, for one, they're not getting federal funds. That's what I take away from that. That's very important. That means they're standing on their own. In that case, they are extremely weak. You can take them down by open resistance because they don't have any backing from the uh, Gestapo feds anymore. Also, they're planning on putting on another tax and they have all these other schemes to keep their business running. It's extortion. And it is the exact same thing they did that led up to the war for independence. There's only so many times that you can poke the bear before it mauls you. And that's what's happening now. They don't understand that this is history repeating itself. That this is the same activities that led to the war for independence in the first place. So, it's not a civil war we're looking at. It's a... Re restoration of the Republic through another war for independence to oppose and properly adjudicate the crimes of foreign adversaries. They have put a lien on our lives, so uh, justice could be putting a lien on theirs. A quote-unquote bill of attainder, which cannot go beyond the life of the individual being attained, according to the Constitution, anyway. Also, it should be of note in this document, where it states, the Hawking Valley Community Hospital, hospital the Hawking Valley Community Hospital is organized as a county hospital under provisions of the general statutes of the state of Ohio. The Board of Trustees are appointed by the county commissioners and the probate and common police court judges. The hospital began operations in 1966 and has a 25-bed acute care unit and a 10-bed geriatric unit. Hawking Valley Community Hospital operates on a fiscal year ending December 31st. The county has issued debt on behalf of the hospital using the county's general taxing authority, and the hospital pays the debt service on this debt. Because the hospital is a county hospital, as defined under Ohio Revised Code and the county does use their taxing authority to issue debt on behalf of the hospital, the hospital is presented as a component unit of Hawking County. Separately issued audited financial statements can be obtained from Hawking Valley Community Hospital, blah, blah, blah. Right above it, it states the component unit column in the basic financial statements identifies the financial data of the county's component unit, Hawking Valley Community Hospital. This component unit is reported separately from the primary government to emphasize that it is legally separate from the county. That is the same thing that they've been doing all the time, where they form these quote-unquote creatures that are quote-unquote legally separate, and so they basically can get away with anything because they're not controlled by the people who, well, you know. It's, uh, it's all just uh, layers, and, and it's layering, right? Uh, which is a, a basic concept when it comes to money laundering. But it's, it's many other things, and it is most certainly criminal. So here's the bylaws of that Buckeye Joint County Self-Insurance Council, which is, again, property of the Ohio Risk Management Plan. The Buckeye Joint County Self-Insurance Council hereby adopts the following bylaws provided for the designation of the officers of the council and the method of selection thereof, creating a governing board that may act for the council as provided in such bylaws and providing for the conduct of the business of the council. Section 1, Membership. The initial membership of the council shall be those counties that enter into an agreement to join said council as of the time of the first meeting of the council on April 10th, 1986. Subsequent to the initial membership, any county within the state of Ohio may apply to the council for membership, subject to such terms and provisions as set forth by the council and subject to a vote of by the majority of the voting members of the council approving the application. The initial fee for membership shall be as designated by the council. So here you have a board of juridic entities that is formed by juridic entities for the purpose of juridic entity. It has absolutely nothing to do with the people that live in the area. It all has to do because they are cattle. They are individuals with a lien on their lives, basically in perpetuity. <clears throat> and they have to be extorted of every single possible form of revenue that they can imagine, right?
voting members upon the initial organization of the council. All counties that are members of the council shall have voting rights, each member county having one vote. Upon the self-insurance program being established and offered to council members for a period of 30 days, then only those members that have joined the program and contributed their proportionate share to the program shall have voting rights, each particular county having one vote. Now, the footnote for OPRM slash OPHC, formerly known as the Ohio Government Risk Management Plan. Risk Pool Management. Prior to 2009, the government belonged to the Ohio Government Risk Management Plan. Let's read that again. Prior to 2009, the government belonged to the Ohio Government Risk Management Plan, in brackets, the plan. Does not belong to the quote-unquote people. It belongs to this entity, as in the government is its property. That interesting. A non-assessable, unincorporated, nonprofit association providing a formalized, jointly administered self-insurance risk management program and other administrative services to Ohio government's members. The plan was legally separate from its member government. On January 1, 2009, through an internal reorganization, the plan created three separate nonprofit corporations, including Ohio Plan Risk Management Incorporated (OPRM), formerly known as the Ohio Risk Management Plan, Ohio. Plan Health Care Consortium Incorporated, OPHC, formerly known as Ohio Health Care Consortium. Ohio Plan Incorporated mirrors the oversight function previously performed by the Board of Directors. The Board of Trustees consists of 11 members that include appointed and elected officials from member organizations. Well, isn't that nice? Now, the pool's audited financial statements conform with generally accepted accounting principles and reported following as its liabilities and retaining earnings at December 31st, 2010 and 20, 2009. 2010, they're listed as having members' equity of 7,191,485 for OPRM. OPHC having 300,035. In 2009, 6 million. 323,701 in OPRM and in OPHC 105,185. Now, the Buckeye Joint County Insurance Council total assets in 2007 were 59,080, 2006, 56,676, change 2,404. 2005, 29,750, change 26,926. That's a pretty big change. Total net assets, 59,080, 2007, 2006, 48,652, change 10,428, 2005, 29,738, change 78,390. This is very strange. These numbers do not seem accurate considering the area al allegedly served, right? Now we understand why those numbers seem so low when we realize that the entity is property of the Ohio Plan Risk Management Incorporated out of Toledo, Lucas County. Purpose for which corporations formed any purpose not involving pecuniary gain or profit, which any natural persons may lawfully associate, including but not limited to the provision of a group self-insurance property and casualty program for political subdivisions as authorized and contemplated by Section blah blah of the Higher Advice Code. It's obviously that um, Buckeye Joint Self-Insurance Council. All that money goes to this entity, a private corporation. This document is signed by Peter J. Krems, Authorized representative out of Cleveland, Ohio. Toledo and Cleveland are very far from each other, mind you. And both are extremely far from the Hocking Hills, Columbus, or any of these regions specified in that so-called self-insurance council. At the end, Peter J. Krems, Esquire. This is your foreign operative, your bar card holder. Now, subsequent agent appointment... Laura A. Abrams, again, Esquire out of Batavia, Ohio, for the Ohio Plan Risk Management Incorporated. Here, name of current agent, Peter J. Krems, Ohio Plan Risk Management Incorporated. Co uh, appointment of, or name and address of new agent, Laura A. Abrams, Batavia, Ohio. Acceptance of appointment for domestic 
entity's agent, Laura A. Abrams, Ohio Plan Risk Management Incorporated. Does that mean that this entity is not owned by foreign interests, say in Switzerland, the Vatican, in London, or etc.? Just means that this is their local face. Authorized representative is listed as Michael T. Hinnenkamp for president. That name right there is very important. Now, in the uh, 2022, we have the Abrams Law Firm, LLC, out of Batavia, for the Ohio Plant Risk Management Incorporated, again, nonprofit certificate of continued existence. Again, this is listed out of Toledo, very far from Cleveland and very far from the Hawking Hills region, which listed this entity on their audit. Here it states Christopher Gilbert as director officer or three members in good standing. Obviously, he's a director or officer, not a member. And the current statutory agent's name and address is Laura A. Abrams. So that name, Michael T. Hinnenkamp, dear valued Ohio plan member, my name is Michael Hinnenkamp, and I am an honored and privileged to introduce myself. Notice that word. I am honored and privileged. Privileges are given by sovereigns. To introduce myself as the new executive director of the Ohio plan. The plan is celebrating its 30th year of risk management service to our members, and I am humbled and excited to lead this outstanding organization into its next chapter. As a lifelong resident of Ohio, I have spent my entire career working for the betterment of Ohio public entities. And there you have your backstory of a local face when, in fact, this is all done on behalf of foreign interests that lead back to that lean on your life done centuries ago. Overall, I have more than 30 years of executive public leadership experience working for three different Ohio public entities. I've also served as a board member of the Ohio plan for more than 20, 20, 22 years. Notice this is from the Highland Ohio plan. So here we get another layer. Highland states, we're focused on your interests, not ours. In the context of this video, that certainly retains a signet, um a sinister ring to it even without the context of the video it sounds pretty sinister to be honest now under the Highland Ohio plan notice Ohio is in all caps Highland is not though we have a real maze of juridic entities and shell corporations that all run around moving assets and hiding things and laundering all this money that is taken from all of us be it having a lien on our lives and everything needing to be extracted to pay back those debts that were re-put into force and that we will never pay off because all those debts are fraudulent and all of this stuff is fraudulent and these people are all foreign adversaries and they had no authority to revoke the U.S. Constitution or repeal it or any of these other stupid games they play. And all of them are culpable for every possible crime that you could imagine or other or unimaginable uh, crimes. And in order for that to be done, we need a, a restoration of the Republic so that we have a legitimate enforcement mechanism to adjudicate these crimes for the individuals doing them. Anyway, the Ohio Plan Risk Management Stoli Insurance Group, the 30th anniversary of the Ohio Plan Whitaker's Myers Group, Spangler Nathanson PLL and the Ohio Plan, and working together to protect the protectors, law enforcement, fire and rescue, and correction services are founded in risk. Most everything our first responders do involves them, blah, blah, blah. And then, of course, students. So, yeah, they basically are behind a lot of stuff, and they have others behind them, and so on and so forth. They are layers that will generally, as far as I've found to be the pattern in all my research, go back to Europe in some way. Now, the FOP Legal Defense Plan lists Highland, Sedgwick, and the National Fraternal Order of Police, FOP being the Fraternal Order of Police, and, of course, the Board of Trustees. And it states, FOP Legal Defense Plan, legal defense protection is a necessity for law enforcement professionals. As the frequency and cost of allegations arise, the FOP Legal Defense Plan offers you and your lodge members a very affordable and comprehensive plan. And so, 
what we realize when we track that whole maze of front corporations and all this other stuff is that money taken from the tax payers, quote unquote, the people who are extorted for things they call taxes, a tax, of course, being um, uh, a money taken from a certain service product or otherwise, things like that, in the general definition of what taxes, like a tariff or, or a tithe, all that money filters through this organization and circles right back to the Gestapo thugs that extort it from the people. Go figure. <laughs> now, this scheme and other schemes bears a resemblance to something that happened in Lancaster, Ohio, a scheme that still goes on today. And this looks almost a copy of the thing that they're currently doing in the Hocking Hills. This document relates to the Keller Farmers Market and has to do with uh, the regulations behind being involved in a farmer's market. Here it states the Vendor Advisory Committee nominations. The Vendor Advisory Committee helps to shape the market and re represents vendor and customer interests. These three elected vet vendors will work in liaison with market staff in the Lancaster Fresh Market Board. So like, like with that other thing with Hawking Hills, you find layers upon layers of faces and frontmen. One of these vendors will sit as a vendor representative on the board of directors. And in the video that he did about this, I directly related the, this entity back to Switzerland specifically. Here it states, I have proof of insurance for $1 million, right? Exactly like that Hawking Hills program, same amount. General liability insurance, naming Lancaster Fresh Market Incorporated as an additional insured. So just like with the Hawking Hills document, this is saying in essentially a different way in one line, what they said in multiple lines, which is that if there is an issue, you will pay for their quote unquote defense or them to, you know, you'll be paying the opposition essentially, which of course means more accurately that they can go and collect that money, taking you to the cleaners as it were because you signed this fraudulent document and their corrupt banking courts, courts uh, which they are all involved in, and those corrupt banking port courts appoint people to these positions, well, obviously they're going to process it, and thus you will forfeit the monies that rightfully are theirs because everything you have is rightfully theirs considering the lien on your life, and it all goes back to foreign interests in Europe. Lo and behold, the board of the Lancaster Fresh Market offers an array of expertise yeah right including local business professionals our board is comprised of president kim sheldon community member vice president brad guralski community member vendor farmer keller market house manager treasurer amanda everett executive director of destination downtown lancaster so here you get the first name that is an overtly quote unquote government agent even though the government is in fact a private corporation as well where one hand washes the other, essentially. That's the concept. Secretary Andrea Spires, Program Officer at Fairfield County Foundation. Elizabeth Baker, owner of B-Pops LLC, Business Intelligence Strategy, Strategist at Over for Life. And also notice Travis Markwood, Executive Director of Lancaster Fairfield County Chamber of Commerce. David Scheffler, Mayor of Lancaster. So yeah, as they say, one hand washes the other. Thank you. If you have enjoyed this video, please join my newly formed Discord. Also, there are free books available at the links, and if you so desire, you may support my work at PayPal or Cash App. Although, honestly, I don't feel any reason for doing these endings anymore because I do believe all of this stuff is monitored and it all goes back to the same corrupt pockets anyway. But for congruency purposes, I will continue doing it.